it's a pleasure to be here and perhaps uh, we can learn something and have some fun and uh, um, that's uh, my objective tonight. So uh, fortunately, you know, I love flying small airplanes and that means I, I don't have to fly airliners and uh, which is kind of nice. And especially since my last airline flight, uh, that's what it looked like. And uh, it wasn't, it was a very discount airline flight, but I felt nervous when I got on the airplane and uh, you could figure out why. So I don't have to do that. But the neat thing about it was about 27 years ago, I owned, or 26 years ago, owned a nice A36 Bonanza and sold that and bought a nice P210, probably one of the most amazing airplanes I've, I've ever owned and flown. It's just a wonderful airplane. My wife and I bought the uh, airplane basically because flying over the Midwest, at 10,000 feet uh, or 12,000 feet in many cases, 12.5, wearing a nasal cannula and uh, getting just bumped around in the P2 and the uh, A36 Bonanza, we decided that uh, maybe we need something that goes up a little higher. And it had air conditioning, which is really, really nice and uh, that worked, <laughs> which is even nicer. And then, of course, I uh, sold that airplane and now I own a Cessna 150 Land Omatic. And uh, we don't have to worry about carrying oxygen on the airplane because you never get high enough to actually need it, except, except at night, which uh, then, you know, that's a slightly different scenario, but we'll talk about that perhaps as we go along. The objective tonight is to talk about the, uh, you know, some of the principles, the, the basic unique things about VFR flying versus IFR flying, and a couple tips and techniques that might help you uh, on your VFR cross-country flights. And uh, the thing that I find, uh, the things that I, that I find interesting about uh, flying VFR is when I was young, I wanted to fly IFR all the time. I mean, I would get an IFR clearance uh, to go to any airport I was going to, even if it was only 10 miles away, because it was exciting talking air traffic control and being part of that system. I would even get an IFR clearance to go to the run-up area. I, I mean, I would, I would, I loved flying IFR. As I got older, I, I realized that um, flying IFR is is fun, especially when the weather's bad, you know, because it gets you to a place where you would not ordinarily be able to go. And that's why you primarily fly IFR. But as I grew older, I realized I was missing out on a great deal of fun. And the fun I was missing out on was the, the joy, excitement, and beauty of being able to just fly VFR. And there is a, um, uh, other than just the uh, philosophical aesthetic quality of enjoying looking outside the airplane, uh, Dr. Irving Bertelman uh, at UCI Irvine came up with an interesting theory that he named the panorama effect. And basically it stated, without going into the, the great detail uh, of it, the, it's an article on my blog, by the way, if you wanted to read that. He basically stated that uh, we uh, human beings uh, have um, a, a tremendous amount of pleasure experience a tremendous amount of pleasure from looking at wide open vistas. We experience what they call an opiate release uh, from looking in the brain now, not anywhere else, just uh, in the brain, the natural opiates that are released in the brain that uh, cause us to feel a tremendous amount of pleasure when we see wide open spaces. And perhaps that results from a, uh, the fact that the majority of our brain processing power it goes into analyzing visual stimuli, but also it also has a natural selective effect because when you are in a wide open space, you can see predators pr approaching from long distances. And uh, obviously that's very conducive to living a long life. So the fact is I enjoy flying VFR now far much more than I enjoy flying IFR and I'll fly IFR when I have to, but it's uh, the panorama effect that just seems to be getting more and more exciting for me as I get older. And I guess I guess uh, one of the most exciting things for me too is to be able to amplify the enjoyment by, um, and this, is, this may be specific to me, but when I'm up at altitude, I take out my thermos, I pour a little coffee, and then I sit there and I enjoy a cup of coffee as I'm flying. Now, maybe I'm the only person that does this, but I don't think so, but I don't, I don't know too many other people that do. But I took off out of Reno one time, I uh, got some... Um, Pete's coffee from the hotel at Reno, nice little thermos. I'm climbing out of Reno, my P210, and I'm avoiding all the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, building potential convective cumulus, and it's a little bumpy. I eventually get up to about 12,000 feet, smooths out, and I thought, ah, fantastic. I have my shoes off, my feet are on the floor, air is rushing over my, my uh, 
hot feet because I use the rudders a lot. So they actually do get a little hot. And uh, yeah, I just take my shoes off and relax at cruise altitude. So I thought I'll pour some coffee. I poured some coffee, put it between my legs and I put the thermos away. I hit a bump and all of a sudden I put the thermos down. I look and my coffee cup is gone. It turned out my coffee cup fell and had a lid on it, by the way. It fell into my shoe. And I'm telling you exactly as this happened. And cold co or hot coffee is pouring into my shoe. I pick up the shoe with the coffee upside down that has now filled three quarters of my shoe. I turn the cup up. It's almost all gone now and the coffee is in my shoe. And as I said, one of the great sources of pleasure for me and perhaps for other people is, you know, just enjoying the panoramic effect and the cruise altitude. And I thought, <laughs> there's no way I'm letting that coffee go to waste. Flipped off the lid, poured that coffee back in the shoe, capped it, and I thought, well, here goes. And I took a little taste of that Pete's coffee, and my very first thought was, hmm, tastes like Starbucks. And that was, uh, I thought, that's how they do it. Apparently, they just have a whole vat of shoes that they run the coffee through at Starbucks, and it tasted just like it. But it was a great experience, not necessarily drinking it for my shoe, but it was a great experience. The interesting thing about flying IFR is this. When you fly IFR versus VFR, VFR flying requires a lot more creativity in terms of IFR flying. IFR flying is a, uh, an, an example or demonstration of your ability to follow some very complex rules. So uh, VFR flying is not quite like that. VFR flying requires a lot more decision making because the rules aren't set out for you. So one has to be a little more creative in terms of how one climbs to avoid, uh, let's say, uh, potential turbulence, uh, avoid clouds, um, to avoid restricted airspace, special use airspace, and so on. And I've always found, thought that to be part of the interesting challenge of VFR flying. IFR flying, like I say, um, does require a little bit of creativity, but you have to be, you have to have a good command and knowledge of the rules to fly IFR. Now, the interesting thing about VFR flying, that another aspect of it I enjoy is I have never known anybody who uh, was subject to a certificate action by the FAA because they lost more than 300 feet on a VFR flight. In other words, flying at some VFR altitude. But the potential exists for losing or for uh, experiencing some sort of certificate action on a, an IFR flight if you lose more than 300 feet. Thus, you can see there's a greater amount of diligence and thus a greater amount of risk associated with IFR flying if you're just doing it in VFR conditions and not doing it because the weather's bad in this instance. Now, of course, you can fly IFR and file an IFR flight plan in good weather, and you might do so just to keep proficient. And I do that on occasion, but the majority of my flying is VFR, and I find that a lot of people like flying IFR and that I don't think they spend as much time flying VFR and thus I would challenge you to perhaps try VFR flying, uh, try, uh, you know, picking a chart uh, it, or taking your iPad, whatever, ForeFlight, whatever you're using. Believe it or not, I have ForeFlight on my iPad, but I still use a handheld sectional chart because I guess, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to change old habits, but there's something unique about holding the paper and being able to expand it whatever way I want and actually have a full scale panorama on the chart. It's just something I enjoy doing. But um, that, you know, it's something that I, uh, I would encourage you to do. And what about flight following when flying VFR? Um, interesting thing, um, if you're not getting flight following when flying VFR, I would recommend you do so, and I'm, I'm going to give you a couple good reasons I think you might find useful or helpful, and that is people typically fly IFR uh, in one sense because they like having someone to talk to, not because they're lonely. It's just that they like having someone to talk to, and it's a security thing. You know, if your engine quits, you have a problem, the air traffic controller is right there. Well, for VFR flying, um, you don't really have to talk to anybody. In fact, you can take off from Corona Airport. Uh, here in Southern California and fly all the way to the East Coast and never have to talk to one person. You can land at a non-tower airport. You don't need a radio to do that, although it's nice to use one if you obviously, uh, if you have one on board, but you don't need to do that. So we still have that potential here in the United States to do that. However, uh, flight following is a very useful tool and I use it uh, quite frequently when I am flying uh, VFR. And 
couple of interesting things about flight following, things I, I like. Number one, you'd say, well, you know, maybe I wouldn't use flight following because I have ADSB, I have TIS, TAS, I have some other traffic identifying mechanism on the airplane. And that may be true. Uh, the problem is depending on the scale of the traffic service you're using, in particular ADSB, uh, depending on what scale you're using, it's possible to have very fast moving traffic uh, come at you and not be identified if you're using a, in other words, not be identified in a reasonable amount of distance if you're using a very tight scale, um, close in scale on your ADSB unit or TIS, TAS, whatever else you happen to be uni using. So flight following is advantageous that way. Um, and the uh, thing I find unique about people flying VFR, first of all, when you mentioned the word flight following, I, I always thought it was interesting. I, I had one student one time I said, you know, we're going to get some flight following on this flight. I'm going to introduce you to it. And he said, well, who are we going to follow? He, he actually kind of thought we were going to follow someone on flight following. Well, you don't have to do that. Although it's a novel idea. Interesting. Yeah, we're going to follow that guy right there. He's taken off and he's in a slow airplane. We'll have no problem following. Hopefully he knows where he's going. So, uh, but the other thing about VFR flying that's unique, and using tra a flight following is that you do get benefits in terms of TFR and MOA avoidance. First of all, if a TFR pops up, the air traffic controller typically knows about it but, uh, right on the spot. They get that information. They know there's a TFR and it is possible you might be en route and not have heard of an upcoming TFR and uh, or maybe you didn't catch one. That's quite possible too. And it's unlikely an air traffic controller is ever going to let you fly through a TFR if they see you heading toward one and, and they obviously know better and they will uh, obviously give you the information. I've never heard of anybody uh, flying through a TFR while under flight following control. I'm not saying it's not possible to happen, but uh, typically air traffic controller does uh, provide you with that information. Uh, MOAs are also very valuable. You know, if you're taking off going from anywhere, uh, let's say in the LA area going eastbound, let's say you're going to uh, oh, Prescott, Arizona, Winslow, or you're heading out toward Albuquerque, you have to fly through the turtle MOA and uh, that or fly in near or around the turtle MOAs. They're three of them out there. And they're active, uh, you know, quite frequently. The military does a lot of training out there. And having flight following out, of, out in that area is very, very valuable. So uh, those things uh, really do help a great deal. The other thing I like about flight following is this. If I'm en route, uh, I key the mic and I call air traffic control and I say, LA Center, this is 2132 Bravo. Do you have anybody ahead of me uh, in a, uh, at a similar altitude that can give me a turbulence report? or an icing report, or a, a convective report. In, in VFR, obviously, I'm more concerned about uh, turbulence here. And, you know, you get some great information from air traffic control like that. Um, my, my friend Dave Gwynn was 727 captain for TWA, and uh, he said he picked up, uh, you know, clicked that microphone and was flying at some flight level, maybe flight level 280 uh, or something like that. And he said, uh, Albuquerque Center, do you have uh, an aircraft ahead of me that uh, can give me a, a turbulence report? And the controller said, Roger, we do. Apparently there's an American Airlines 20 miles ahead. And the report is the captain just stabbed himself with his dinner fork. So <laughs> you can get an idea of what kind of turbulence that was. So a good thing to do, and I would recommend you use and solicit air traffic controllers uh, PIREPs or air traffic controller generated PIREPs that way. The other thing that's interesting about getting flight following is this. If you are, at, let's say, at a lower altitude and you're flying from one airport to the next, uh, you're getting flight following after, as you depart, then the question that comes up is, well, if I am flying through class C airspace or I'm flying through class D airspace, uh, in particular class D airspace, as I'm getting flight following, um, or if there's two, there are two blocks of class D airspace close together and I am heading for the farthest class D airport and I have to penetrate the class D airspace or I will penetrate the class D airspace of the nearest mm -hmm. airport, do I have to call air traffic? control, in other words, the tower facility at the nearest airport, 
to establish communication to fly through? And the answer to that is found in the Air Traffic Controller's Manual. It's not found in the AIM. And here's what the Air Traffic Controller's Manual says. It says, and <clears throat> this is uh, section seven, by the way, 7110.65 Victor, section 2116. And it says this, that the air traffic controller will coordinate with the appropriate non-approach control tower or an individual aircraft uh, basis before issuing a clearance, which would require flight within a surface area for which the tower has responsibility unless otherwise specified in the letter of agreement. And the air traffic controller will coordinate with the appropriate control tower for transit authorization when you are providing radar traffic advisory service to an aircraft that will enter another facility's airspace. So, air traffic control is supposed to take care of communicating with the tower or facility for you when you are transiting another airport's Class D airspace. That's not me speaking, that's the FAA speaking. However, irrespective of what you see here, I would always, let me repeat, always ask the controller from whom I am receiving flight following if I have clearance to penetrate the upcoming Class D airspace. Now, do I not blatantly trust air traffic control to do the right thing in this instance? <laughs> of course not. Why would I trust a human being not to make a mistake regarding this peculiar and often controversial topic that could cost me my pilot certificate? It's just much better to trust but verify when you can. Thanks. Now, the other thing that's interesting about VFR flying is uh, certainly you wouldn't, I hope you wouldn't do this IFR. It, it, this makes me nervous as, uh, as heck whenever I hear somebody doing that, and that is running a tank dry. Now, in this instance. Now, the other thing that's interesting about VFR flying is uh, certainly you wouldn't, I hope you wouldn't do this IFR. It, it, this makes me nervous as, uh, as heck whenever I, here's somebody doing that, and that is running a tank dry. Now, if I could see you, I would, uh, I would ask how many people would run a tank dry on an airplane. And see, this is a great way to test your triple bypass. Should you happen to have one of those things, just to make sure you got a good triple bypass, have that engine stop running while you're at cruise flight. Uh, I've never run a tank dry in nearly 50 years of flying, and that is because, well, maybe I ran a tank dry once, but <laughs> it was such a long time ago. I think I blocked it out. Um, it is just an unnerving feeling, and there's no reason to do it. Unless, of course, you actually want to test if your engine can ingest whatever particulate matter happens to be at the bottom of the tank, and I don't think you want to do that. So uh, my recommendation is, you know, always leave about 30 minutes worth of fuel in each tank. And uh, it's not that difficult, really, to be able to plot and plan that out. That's just my personal preference. Uh, your mileage may vary, but that's my, my personal preference. I mentioned oxygen at the very beginning of our uh, presentation here. And um, I'd like if you have a, a, a portable oxygen system, I'd like you to try an experiment for me. First time I did this many years ago, I, I have to admit, I became a believer. This, get, this will get you religion and oxygen religion. I guess which is a good religion to have and it, because you can always replenish your tank. That, that'd be great. And you go down, replenish your tank, get some oxygen, go up at night, get up to about uh, you five, 6,000 feet. And hopefully it's a nice dark night. Take a look at the stars. And you've probably heard of this before, but it's a great experiment to do. And you say, okay, there are stars out there. You know, you know there are stars out there. You can't really see them, but you have an astronomy book at home that actually proves that stars uh, are, are out there at night. So then you take and turn on the oxygen and take a hit of oxygen, either through the cannula, the mask, whatever, and watch what happens outside. It is insanely strange because all of a sudden you see far more stars, thus proving your astronomy book is actually correct. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see how uh, dependent your visual system is on oxygen at night, to say nothing of your mental system. So uh, I know people that fly, even during the day, they'll take a hit of oxygen. It's, it's, it sounds like something illegal, doesn't it? Uh, wait, Bob, give me a hit of oxygen, but let's do it before uh, any of the passengers see what's going on. It's uh, no, perfectly legal, and they'll do it during the day just to make sure they have 100% uh, access to their mental faculties. A wise thing to do. Um, high or low cruise altitudes when flying VFR? 
Well, my preference is to fly somewhere around 10,000, 11,000 feet, a little higher than that, of course, than, you know, above 12.5. For, for more than 30 minutes, you're required to have oxygen. And if you're like me, and I know I am, uh, I uh, don't particularly enjoy having a nasal cannula attached to my face, but, uh, you know, you do it when you have to. Fortunately, in the Cessna 150, I, I don't have to worry about those things because we never get up high enough to actually require a nasal cannula. 12,000 feet is our goal, uh, actually, in the Cessna 150. But here's an interesting thing about the uh, high cruise altitudes that I don't think people pay that much attention to. There's actually a lot of safety value if you're flying a high-performance airplane, flying somewhere around 10,000 to 12,000 feet uh, for this reason, and, and of course, a little higher. Take a look at this. This is my Cessna 210, and uh, I am indicating 130 knots and 17,500 feet. I'm heading off to Albuquerque, on this flight, the ground speed, it is a great day to be flying, by the way. The ground speed's 236 knots and uh, at 17.5. And here's the deal. The uh, maximum gear extension speed in the Cess this Cessna 210 was 140 knots. Now, keep in mind, that's the maximum gear e e extension speed. Um, so uh, it, it is also the maximum gear operating speed. Yeah, I think at 142 for the maximum gear operating speed. And of course, this varies between airplanes. But here's what I know. If I encountered severe turbulence or extreme turbulence or some type of really nasty turbulence and I had to slow the airplane down and I had to slow it down quickly, I could do it immediately by putting the gear down instead of having to pull the throttle back and slow the airplane down below the gear extension speed and then put the gear down. Again, 140 maximum gear extension speed I could take put the gear down at 130 and it's not going to hurt the gear. It's not going to hurt the gear doors. And I could slow the airplane down quickly to below VA, which I think, in, if I recall correctly, was 114 miles per hour in the P210 at this weight. And therefore, I am able to, you know, have the comfort of being able to slow down to at or below VA very quickly. So kind of a neat thing about, and you get that, by the way, for most airplanes by flying above 10,000 feet. And about that sweet spot altitude. You have that uh, lower indicated airspeed, but a very high true airspeed, of course, especially in this condition at 17.5. It's pretty interesting. Now, weather. I, I get so excited about this because, you know, one of the things I learned a long time ago about flying an airplane is that you want maximum performance with minimum effort. Not because pilots are lazy, but because when you have maximum performance with minimum effort, you have more time to look around, plot, plan, and scheme. And that is extremely important when it comes to flying an airplane. If you're so busy with doing different things in the airplane and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're really so far behind the airplane that uh, you, know, it, you can barely keep up, you know, that's not a good place to be in any airplane. Of course, you can slow the airplane down, which would help in, in many instances. But in this instance, you want to be able to plot, plan, and scheme. And one of the things that you don't need to be in an airplane as a pilot is a meteorologist. Now, of course, the emphasis is on studying weather, and you should study weather and learn as much about it as you can. But I sometimes wonder, wonder whether people feel uh, a tremendous lack of confidence because they don't have an ability to predict the weather. Well, think about this. As a pilot, you're not, you don't need to predict the weather. You need to apply the weather. We pay people to predict the weather. Those people are called meteorologists and they do a very good job of it. Now, 20 years ago, you could actually make the case that meteorologist was the Greek word for liar, but it's not now. I mean, the, the accuracy of, uh, of our uh, tradition, our common forecast is, is quite uh, phenomenal. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very comforting experience. So you have to be good at applying the weather. So predicting versus applying. And you have so many wonderful tools, all the way from graphical analysis uh, for pilots that you get prior to a departure. And you get at, that at the National Weather Service or at... Uh, uh, at Lato's Flight Service Station. All that information is there. I'm not going to talk about that. But you also have NEXRAD as a valuable tool for pilots, uh, VFR pilots, while using, uh, while uh, en route. 
And the neat thing about NixRed is this. While you're not flying IFR in this instance, I have a whole other program talking about how to use NixRed for IFR flying. But for VFR flying, NixRed provides information on where potential thunderstorms are. And if you know where a potential thunderstorm is, and you can use your sighting mechanism as long as what you as well as what you see on the next red chart, then you have the ability to uh, apply the FA's recommended avoidance principle when flying in near and or around a thunderstorm. We know that we should avoid thunderstorms by 20 miles minimum. And if a thunderstorm is extremely tall, look, let, as a general rule, you should avoid thunderstorms without making it complicated by 20 miles. So what is a thunderstorm? Typically, people identify it as the downburst that uh, comes from a thunderstorm, which you only see in the mature stage. But when you look on a uh, next rad display, and when you see, hmm, red or orange or, hmm, yellow, what, what do you have to see on an X-ray display to have it be officially categorized as a potential thunderstorm? Hmm, there is an answer to that. And the answer is you're looking for the color that represents 40 decibels of reflectivity. Now on uh, ADSB, or, or TISB weather, what you, uh, in, in this case, um, FISB, excuse me, what you have is a dark orange color representing a uh, 40 decibels of return. In other words, that's the radar energy that is returned after a beam is sent out from the radar antenna and that 40 decibels, that's a scale value now, it's a logarithmic scale, but it's a scale, it's a scale number. And that number represents the potential for a thunderstorm. Now it's red on a, an airline pilot's radar screen, but it's not necessarily red on next red. It can be uh, an orange color, it can be a dark orange, or it can be red. The only way you will know is to look at the scale provided by your weather service provider. And you're looking for 40 dBZs. And on the picture shown right there, anything that is red or a very dark orange color, and I, I don't know if I can, you can actually see that where I'm moving my cursor, but that dark, dark orange color right there is the um, re representation of 40 decibels of energy return, thus, the potential for a building thunderstorm. That and the area around it is the area where you want to avoid. In particular, that, that very dark orange color, 20 miles away from the center of that color is what you want to avoid in VFR conditions. You don't want to be anywhere underneath that, uh, if at all possible, and for obvious reasons. Oh, what obvious reasons? Well, let's take a look at this. It's a, it's a picture of a, a downburst. And it's a, a pretty interesting downburst. It basically, the first uh, sign of a mature stage of a thunderstorm is when you get a tremendous water rush from underneath the uh, building, or the, the thunderstorm itself. And it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's one place you never want to be in an airplane, folks. When you see water falling from a, th from a, th a thunderstorm, the Strategic Air Command said many years ago that that uh, area right there should be avoided by a 50 mile radius when you see an actual downburst of water from a thunderstorm. Why 50 miles? Well, that's twice as much as the FAA's recommended 25 miles away from a thunderstorm, but 50 miles is a uh, uh, apparently appropriate figure if you're flying a military aircraft like a B-52 and you're landing at any airport within a 50 mile radius of that downburst, you can get wind gusts of 80 miles per hour. So it's, it's, it can be real serious stuff, but you can see it. And you also have the clue on the next red to help you identify that too. So pretty interesting uh, things to think about in terms of the tools you have available to you to help you fly more comfortably and safely. Now, dog legs. Uh, whenever I fly, and I'm going to fly over mountains in any airplane for that matter, even a 210, I look at the route and I say, is there any way I can avoid flying directly over the mountain? So wh why would I want to avoid mountains? Well, number one, even mm -hmm. if I am several thousand feet above them, I want to avoid them because uh, it's clear that if you had an engine failure, there's nowhere to go. 
the only place you're going to go is perhaps between trees on the sli- side of a slope or some very unfavorable, unhospitable place that doesn't have a hospital nearby. So I avoid that with a passion, simply because you, you have to think strategically and you have to think tactically, uh, which means you think defensively when flying. Here's the interesting thing about taking a slightly alternate route around mountainous areas. If I were to take off from, let's say, the LA Basin right here in, uh, well, I think that looks like, I'm not sure what that is right there. It looks like uh, maybe Van Nuys or something. If I'm going to take off from Van Nuys and I'm going to go to uh, Reno, I can head directly to Reno and uh, obviously as the crow flies and that, uh, you know, is a very straight route and probably easy to do in a P210 or for that matter, turbo normalized A36 Bonanza or for that matter, regular A36 Bonanza Mm -hmm. if you have oxygen. But I don't do that. I take and I'll go to Placerville and then I'll uh, take from Placerville, I'll head up on Route 50 and then I will come into Lake Tahoe and then head directly on over to Lake Ta- uh, Reno. And in doing mm. so, I've basically made a little dog leg. And if I had more time, I, I would make the entire dog. But in this instance, I make a little dog leg. And you think, oh my gosh, look how far you've gone. Look, you've really gone out of your way. And the answer to that is no, <laughs> I really haven't gone out of my, my way. Dog legs are, uh, are, are, uh, present a visual illusion that makes them look like they're a lot longer, of a, a more circuitous route than you'd really want to take. But in reality, the difference here is 35 uh, nautical miles. And at 120 knots true airspeed, which you'll never see in a Cessna 150, uh, but uh, at 120 knots in your Bonanza or perhaps 172, that is only 15 minutes extra to be able to get to Reno. So it's, it's a far more preferable way to fly if you're flying, again, uh, defensively. And that's just a recommendation for you to think about dog legs the next time uh, you, uh, you go flying. So, and if you're ever around a, a group uh, called PETA, people, for the, people who, uh, for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, also known as people who eat tasty animals, uh, you would m- want to make sure you identify you're talking about something on a navigational basis, not real dog legs, because you, you don't want to offend anybody there. So what about VFR en route, planned fuel stops? Here are a few interesting concepts to consider. First of all, the FA requires that you have 30 minute reserve during the day, 45 minute at night. Okay, 30 minute reserve during the day, hmm. That would mean that I would land my Cessna 150 Landomatic with two and a half gallons of fuel in the tanks or 1.25 gallons in each tank. <laughs> now, if you actually ever think about it that way, this seems like the worst idea you could <laughs> ever require for a pilot in flying an airplane. 30 minutes fuel reserve. Oh, but that's the regulation. Okay, fine. And I'm glad it's, that's the minimum. My recommendation is to fly and never land an airplane without at least one hour of fuel reserve in your tank. And one hour of fuel, most airplanes have about a four hour range, four and a half hour range. And uh, <clears throat> some longer, some shorter, but that's about an average. And with one hour of fuel, that's 25% of your fuel load remaining, then that gives you uh, one hour to uh, find another airport in case suddenly somebody decided to plow up the airport you were planning on landing at, or, excuse me, you can't find the airport you were planning on landing at. Uh, As a confession, as a student pilot, I got lost so many times, I just had to keep changing where it was I wanted to go. And it was just much easier. So I I got lost a few times. But uh, whenever you land at an airport and you say, hey, how do you pronounce the name of this airport? And you know the guy at the gas station, he's going to go, you are lost, aren't you? And then you have to fess up. Uh, One hour of fuel reserve. Now, what I have found is that we are such a trusting lot, we pilots. And I I think sometimes it's really worthy uh, uh, of you to be a little more suspicious. Uh, whenever you're on a VFR flight and you're going to, it's a long cross-country flight, obviously VFR in this instance, um, I would recommend before you depart, call the FBO at the airport, call, the, call somebody at the airport and ask them if their fuel service is going to be available when you plan on landing. 
Because sometimes you get to an airport, you land, and all of a sudden they shut down the fuel service because Bob has to go home. Bob is the only guy at the airport that knows how to work everything. So uh, it, you don't want to have that happen. So you call the airport before you go and see if the fuel service is available, how late it will be operating, and most importantly, see what their current method of currency exchange is. Because sometimes they don't take, well, you know, traveler's checks, uh, American Express, uh, Visa, cash, especially if it's out of state cash, uh, they don't take any of these things. You know, you have to be able to, to be able to pay for whatever you're going to put in your tanks. But before you descend for landing at that airport, I would recommend you call Unicom and you can typically get them about at least about 10, 15 miles out, perhaps even before you start your descent and, and call up and make sure that the fuel service is still open. Because if I call Unicom in that instance and I find that the Unicom folks are not answering, then all of a sudden my suspicious mode kicks in and I think, hmm, there's another airport nearby. That would be my alternate. I think, and I can even call them from my position. I'll call them to see if they have fuel available now. And if that's a better deal than what I've got on my original plan, I'm going there to spend my money and get my gas. So there's nothing worse than being trapped at an airport at night without fuel and without a motel or to have to stay in a motel that is uh, like, uh, well, the motel, motel 6, which is kind of like a Dixie dumpster with a checkout time. Now, not all of them are. Some of them are pretty good, but uh, some of them are not. And the ones that are not, <laughs> you don't want to stay in. Look, I stayed in a motel that was so bad that... Uh, at night, the roaches crawled in bed and put their leg over you. So this is, and if you killed a roach, they were so big, you had to make it look like an accident. So you don't want to stay in a place like that. I've uh, traveled too much, uh, too often to know you can be in some strange places. So avoid that with a passion. Okay. Oh, this is, this is just really cool. I'm probably one of the few folks flying around now that still uses an E6B computer. Okay, take a look. See if that looks familiar to you. That's the wind side of an E6B computer. Assuming you know what that is, or go to your local museum, and you can probably find a few of them there, you can buy these things for $15 at ASA. Aviation Supplies and Academics. Just uh, Google it and uh, Google E6B and E6-B and what a deal. This, it's, it's an amazing, no, I don't use an electronic flight computer. I still use my ESB and I can probably do everything just as fast as you can do it as long as I have, have my glasses on uh, because uh, now I... Now, I, um, of course, I, I wear reading glasses. I'm required to just in case I want to do any reading when I'm flying. But I'm only two lenses away, according to the doc, from being a fly. So uh, I don't go anywhere without these. But let me show you what you can do. This is pretty neat. Um, as an example, and there are a lot of things like this you can do. I just want to inspire you to look a little more carefully at using an E6B computer. Um, let's say the winds are 3,000 feet or from 310 degrees, 22 knots. 6,000 feet, 340, 15 knots. 9,000 feet, 030, 10 knots. And 12,000 feet, 010 at 40 knots. That's an, an extreme range, but I've seen winds like this. So what you do is you come back, turn your back or turn the uh, E6B over to the back side, the wind side, take and set the first wind direction here, 310 under the true index. You have the grommet set on 100 just because it's easier to count up, count up from 100. And you mark up the wind value, 20 knot, 22 knots. There you go. Mark up 22 knots. And this is for 3,000 feet. So you might put a little 3,000 right next to that, 3,000. And then you come over here and you do the same thing for 6,000. We're going to make a 6,000 foot wind dot, 340 degrees at 15 knots. We set 340 under the uh, true index and we mark up 15 knots. So there's the 3,000 foot wind dot, or that is the 6,000 foot wind dot. Then we do the same thing over here for 9,000 feet. And then we do the same thing over here for 12,000 feet. Now, here is where the magic begins. My true course for the route that I am flying is 260 degrees. Our true airspeed is 156 knots. Now watch. At 3,000 feet, I'll take and I will go ahead and set 260 degrees. And I will set the uh, 3,000 foot dot on the 156 knot true airspeed arc. 3,000, again, it's set to 260 degrees on the true index, the top left box. 
The 3,000 foot dot is set on 156 knots true airspeed because again, that's my true airspeed for this route. And it appears at 3,000 feet, I would get a ground speed of 141 knots, which is right underneath the center grommet. I'm going to rotate 6,000 feet dot, the 6,000 foot dot to 156 knots. And then I'll see, oh, looks five degree wind correction angle. My ground speed here would be 153 knots. Okay, come down here. And I will then bottom left hand box. I will set the 9,000 foot dot on the 156 arc, true airspeed arc here. And under the grommet, I see a ground speed of 162 knots. Oh, interesting. For 12,000 feet, which gives me, by the way, a 14 degree right wind correction angle, but 12,000 foot, the red dot is set on 156 knots. And the grommet shows a ground speed of 164 knots. Well, essentially, at 9,000 feet, I get a ground speed of 162 knots with only a, looks like about a, um, looks like, what is that? It's a two and a half degree wind correction angle to the right. And I get 162 knots ground speed. Clearly, that's a much better ground speed than if flying at 3,000 or 6,000 feet. And if I were to go up to 12,000 feet, I'd only get two knots more, but I would have a wind correction angle of 14 degrees to the right. And here's where this pays off. I can immediately find what is the best altitude to fly at for the maximum ground speed just by uh, selecting, moving the wind dots on my true airspeed arc. But I can also see from 9,000 to 12,000 feet that's a dramatic change in wind direction. Bottom right-hand box here. I go from a two and a half degree wind correction angle to a almost a 14 degree wind correction angle. And my experience has been that whenever the wind correction angle, excuse me, whenever the wind velocity changes more than four knots per thousand feet, you're gonna have some type of moderate turbulence. And I've never calibrated this with a change in wind direction, but I would imagine if your wind direction is changing more than four degrees uh, per thousand feet, you're also going to have a similar amount of uh, turbulence, so moderate turbulence. So here's a way you can use the E6B to uh, be able to test or assay the uh, winds at different altitudes and get an idea, a visual picture of what is perhaps the best altitude uh, for you to fly at. But there are a lot of things like this that you can do with the E6B. So that's just one of them. And hopefully I've inspired you to take a look at that. Oh, by the way, one of the neat things that people don't do when flying on a VFR cross-country flight is, first of all, they typically have trouble finding the airport uh, from great distances. And who doesn't, of course? It's, uh, you know, under low visibility conditions, it's hard to find the airport. Uh, I don't know how many of you fly with... Uh, binoculars, but if you're like me, and, and I know I am, uh, then I, I always carry a, a pair of binoculars in my flight bag. And the reason I do that is because uh, I can't see 20 miles ahead of me and, you know, and identify an airport. I just don't have that kind of sight. And if I take out my binoculars and take a look uh, ahead of me with binoculars, not only can I see 20 miles ahead of me, I can see airplanes that are coming at me 20 miles ahead of me, which is kind of a scary thing. But the fact is that you have a range extender that is kind of like having a movie map display. But in this case, it's the real map. It's the map that you see out the window. So kind of an interesting thing. Think about carrying binoculars when you, whenever you fly. I have found them to be very, very useful and very valuable. And um, descent, when do you descend? Well, typically in a Cessna 150, you never have to worry about descending because you're almost always there. So descending is our goal. And uh, I, you know, I make fun of the Cessna 150, but uh, because I own one, I, I know I can get away with it. And uh, Cessna, my Cessna 150 only has two power settings, by the way. That's right. Uh, two power settings. Fly, no fly fly, no fly. And sometimes it's no fly, no fly. So it just depends. But it's a good little airplane. Do you know that when they originally named the Cessna 150, they named it the Landomatic? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I thought that was so interesting. It was on the literature. And apparently the lawyers, apparently a lawyer took a look at the actual uh, literature and said, oh no, 
he had this great epiphany, this lawsuit epiphany. He said, we got to change that name because certainly somebody's going to think that you can actually landomatize the Cessna 150. And uh, well, <laughs> that's just not true. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You actually have to land the thing. But a great way to find out how quick to descend is uh, assuming you want to make a 500 foot per minute rate, rate of descent, which is reasonable and it keeps your passengers from having uh, eardrums that go off like bongo drums uh, in the back of the airplane. And a 500 foot per minute rate of descent is a very comfortable rate. Then take two, multiply it times your ground speed in nautical miles per minute. At 120 knots, you're going two nautical miles per minute. At 90 knots, you're going one and a half nautical miles per minute, which is typically the altitude you might or the speed you might use. But 120 knots, 90 knots, two nautical miles per minute, one and a half mi nautical miles per minute. And then take that and multiply it, apply it times the altitude loss in thousands of feet. For instance, in the diagram below, if I'm at 8,000 feet above the altitude, the airport elevation, let's say, and or if I have to lose 8,000 feet, then if I'm flying 120 knots, I will multiply two times two nautical miles per minute, that's four, times the altitude loss in thousands of feet, so that's four times eight, that's 32 nautical miles. So the distance I would begin, the altitude, uh, the descent at 500 feet per minute is 32 nautical miles from the airport or from the point where I would enter the traffic pattern or something like that. And there are many other ways to ca calculate altitude descent rates if you're flying a bigger and faster airplane. This just tends to be one of the simplest ones to use. Uh, this is the newest thing, SMX, SMS text weather. And it's pretty cool because if you're at the airport and you're in the airplane, instead of having to pull up Lados Flight Service Station or bring out, uh, you know, uh, switch your um, uh, mapping uh, to the weather from um, on ForeFlight, sometimes you don't want to mess with anything. Just go ahead and uh, text SMS text weather at the Lados Flight Service Station, and all you need to do is type in uh, that number, 358-782, and uh, 358-782, and that's also FLV-SRV, uh, FLT-SRV, Flight Service. You got to put the dash in there. And then just as the message, type in METAR, it can be small or uh, uh, capitalized or regular lettering, METAR space SNA, METAR for the Santa Ana play, airport, and you'll get the METAR right there. If you don't feel like actually, if you want TAF, you type in TAF S space SNA, and you'll get the TAF. If you actually don't feel like interpreting, because you, you didn't bring your Rosetta Stone with you uh, in order to interpret the uh, TAF, then just type in MT space SNA space PT, and that's uh, METAR, Santa Ana, MT, that's short for METAR, space SNA space PT, and that would be the plain language interpretation, and you'll get both METAR and the TAF. Whenever you ask for the plain language interpretation, uh, when you ask for a METAR or a TAF, you get, you get them both. So here is the METAR for the terminal forecast, and METAR is below for Santa Ana, and it's very easy to interpret, and you can use that quite quickly. The FAA once published a book called Terrain Flying, and it's for VFR trips eastbound or westbound. And this was a great book because what it did was it showed you the routes that the uh, older airmail pilots used to fly when they would fly cross country following airway beacons, white flashing airway beacons. Now we don't have white flashing airway beacons anymore, unfortunately. It'd be neat if we did, but then that would be energy uh, consuming and somebody would have to maintain them. But you know, you have the next best thing. You have, uh, you have airports that you can help identify these routes. And if I were flying from, this is one of the pictures from the inside of the book. If I'm flying from Salt Lake City and I wanted to go to Denver, and let's say you didn't have a, um, you didn't have a turbo normalized Cessna 150 with JADO assist takeoff. And uh, you weren't going to be able to fly directly over the Rockies. And that uh, is something you probably wouldn't want to do in a small little airplane anyway, if you can avoid it. This is the next best route to take because this is how the folks did this many years ago when they had airplane engines that were not, excuse me, 
high performance airplane engines, and they couldn't get up above 14, 15,000 feet. So obviously from Salt Lake City to uh, Fort Bridger's, uh, Rock Springs, Rollins, Medicine Bow, Cheyenne, and then down into Denver. It's actually the most comfortable route going across the, or trying to, you know, uh, we, uh, find your way through the Rockies. And this is what it actually looks like here on the sectional chart. And uh, although that looks like a whack chart here, uh, I'm not sure. Um, and we no longer have uh, whack charts. I remember one of the uh, instructors, my early instructors was giving me instruction and in multi-engine flying. He was, he was hitting his hand with his chart. And I said, sir, what are you going to do with that? He says, well, if you mess up, I'm gonna, gonna hit you on the head with this. It was like being in Catholic school. He actually said that. And I thought, well, I can't really say anything because he was using a whack chart at the time. So uh, he was uh, you know, functionally correct there. And, uh, but fortunately, he didn't hit me <clears throat> more than once. So here we go. There we are going the route. And as you can see, the terrain it flies over here is obviously much more comfortable rather than going directly over the Rockies this way to get into Denver. That's pretty cool. And there are other routes too. San Francisco, Torino. You have two routes from San Francisco. You can go up through Sacramento, uh, go over, uh, let's see, uh, Blue Canyon. Uh, the uh, uh, Let's, what do we have now? Nevada County Airport uh, in this area, take Highway 80 and that takes you into Reno or you can go through Placerville, take Highway 50, go up through um, uh, up and, and around Carlson and then go directly into Reno that way. So you have several different options and this makes it a whole lot easier. Here's one from going to Winslow from Daggett and you go to Needles, you'll fly these. These are the turtle moas right here I mentioned earlier. To Kingman, Flagstaff, Winslow. And let's see, Los Angeles, there would be, that would be the route, Blythe, direct to Phoenix. And then from Phoenix, Tucson, El Paso, that's a pretty comfortable route to take right there because that avoids uh, several uh, special use airspace structures and mountains. And from El Paso, you can go directly into Austin this way. It's almost a direct shot. I've flown this route many times. That's very comfortable. And then San Diego to Tucson, again, El Centro, Yuma, Gila Bend, uh, and, uh, Tucson, and then there's from, that's actually from davis Monthan south of Tucson, and then you go directly down into El Paso. And nice route, you have a very large, um, what is that called? Uh, unmanned, uh, what is that? Let me see if exactly what that says. That is unmarked weather balloon. I always thought it was unmanned uh, balloon, and I, I thought it was unmanned because they couldn't get a man to get inside of it, and I don't blame them, but that's unmarked. So, and it goes up to something like around 15,000 feet, so so one has to be careful in that area. And there you go, many different routes. This is the route going from Winslow to the east, uh, heading out Santa Fe, and then from there you can go into Liberal, Kansas, and Liberal, Liberal Kansas is the na actual name of an airport, and uh, Double Eagle to the east. I'll wait for questions, but uh, in the uh, uh, for, for VFR flying, though, I, I, I hope I conveyed the, the sense of enjoyment that uh, one can have when flying VFR. IFR flying is a lot of work, and mm -hmm. you, it's a lot of work because it requires a great deal of precision, and uh, the work that's invested pays off in being able to get to your destination when Mother Nature is, uh, is uh, not uh, supportive of any type of VFR flying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was best expressed by my a friend of a friend, Stoneman's name was Ken. Ken was a FedEx pilot, flew his 206 into San Francisco to attend a FedEx meeting. And uh, after the meeting was done, uh, you know, fog typically just, that advection fog just uh, obscures San Francisco. So it was zero, zero. And Ken decided that he was just going to leave the airplane there and drive home. So as he's waiting uh, to get his rental car, one of the other pilots says, hey, you, you flew in here. Uh, uh, VFR, why, why, why don't you just fly IFR back home? And Ken mm. said, you have to pay me to fly IFR. Now, I always thought that was an interesting statement mm. because what Ken was saying was, it's a lot of work. And as an airline pilot, they pay him to fly IFR all the time. And that, that, that was actually a, a, an interesting statement that represented the amount of commitment and work it takes when you fly IFR, and Ken just didn't want to work that hard that time for whatever reason. He just wanted to enjoy flying, so he drove home, drove back uh, the next day, got his airplane, flew back home. So. And here's what I know about turbulence. Um, and here's what the statistics say. There have 
there has only been on record one or two, and I'll use, I'll do that as plural. There, are, there have only been two records of airplanes breaking up due to turbulence known as clear air turbulence generated from your typical uh, mountain waves and your typical mountain turbulence because airplanes are very resilient. One of those aircraft on record was ex suspected of having flown into the wingtip vortex, wing tip vortex of a 760-757, which has rotational vertiginous energy of 300 feet per second. That's five times as strong as what you find in, the, in a nascent thunderstorm. That's just nasty stuff, and that's why you avoid 757s, 767s, and uh, 380s, and all these other big airplanes. For that matter, any airplane that is considered a, uh, a large or heavy airplane. Uh, those things you avoid. So weight turbulence is physical turbulence, uh, or mechanical turbulence generated from mountains, not likely to hurt your airplane. Uh, it, what it does is it discombobulates you mentally. It has tremendous psychological effect on you. But you have to know that airplanes do not have their wings sheared off by turbulence. The other example or the other uh, report of an airplane experiencing turbulence and having a structural fa failure was when the engine came off, the engine mounts broke because the airplane was flying supposedly at uh, a speed that was in excess of maneuvering speed. The engine mounts were only certified, you know, to handle a certain amount of G-loading. Well, the airplane was lighter. It experienced greater G-loading. They were way above maneuvering speed, supposedly and the engine came off. Now that's what you call losing your engine. But believe it or not, that airplane was a Luscombe and the pilot landed the airplane. I am not making that up. That was in the oh. FA newsletter many years ago and he did it by doing this. He had such an FCG, he had to stuff his body up on top the panel and fly by holding the stick way back here uh, to be able to keep the CG in such a way that he could actually have control of the airplane. <laughs> I didn't, I mean, that just blew me away. So when it comes to turbulence, you have to understand that fact. So you have to have some confidence and be, in, in believe that fact. But you also have to do one more thing. You have to be able to slow the airplane down to below maneuvering speed, to a speed at which uh, the maneuvering speed is appropriate for that weight of the airplane. And uh, then you have to be able to maintain attitude and don't worry about the altitude. This is one time altitude is not an issue. You fly attitude and keep the power set so that you don't exceed the present maneuvering speed for the airplane. You do that, folks, I'll tell you, it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to damage an airplane. That's a fact. I will say this, though. Whenever I hit strong turbulence in an airplane, the, the gut response in me is to uh, look outside to see if the right wing is still on. And uh, then I have the person in the other seat look outside to the left to make sure his wing is still on, as if we wouldn't know. Uh, but so far, after 50 years of flying and some really nasty turbulence, by the way, uh, both wings have stayed on. And I've never had an airplane tilt more than about 60, 65 degrees uh, in turbulence. I've never had an airplane flipped over on its back, but th that can happen. But I will say that the airplanes that have had that happen to them we're flying very close to high altitude mountainous peaks with winds way in excess of 25 knots. Yeah. And as a result, all bets are off then. So you have to use your brains to avoid those areas. And you're quite capable of doing that. Cross country flying yeah. at night. Well, obviously at night, it's harder to find uh, the, it's harder to see the, air, the terrain below you. And um, I think you have to fly very conservatively at night. And that means, of course, having oxygen available, which, uh, which makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, if, if you can do that, it's not very, it's not that expensive to get a, a small portable oxygen unit. And uh, they have them at Sporties and you can find them at uh, uh, scuba shops and many other places. You want to get the, get the one that's appropriate for you. But uh, that would be nice. And lower is better at night in some sense. If you don't have oxygen, flying too high, obviously, your eyes are the first thing that are affected at night. They tend to be the uh, first, first uh, uh, organ that tends to uh, experience a, a deleterious performance uh, when it's deprived of the maximum amount of oxygen it likes to use. But the thing I would do at night is I would, if, if I were, fly, on, folks, if you're flying over 
terrain where you can't see and your engine quits, all bets are off. And so whenever I fly at night, I, you may find this strange, but I fly a very conservative route at night. For instance, if I'm going to Las Vegas at night uh, from, from Los Angeles, I follow follow that big old freeway that goes right out to Las Vegas. And the interesting thing is they put freeways through mountain passes that uh, are the most accessible. And if my engine quits, I always have the BLS to guide me down to a, you know, hopefully safe landing. BLS, what is that? That's called the Buick lighting system. And as a result, it's possible I could land an airplane on a major road and do it rather safely. By the way, the number of people that land airplanes on roads, uh, it, uh, the number is actually far higher than you or I know about, especially the FAA. And the reason for that is landing on a road is actually, now I'm not saying I want you to do this, but as an emergency procedure, it's actually a lot less risky than one might think. And as, assuming you land with traffic and there's not a lot of traffic on the road. I mean, that's because they typically don't put power lines across major freeways. They put them along, but not across, because if a power line were to go down across a major freeway, you can imagine what kind of havoc that would, would wreak at the airport or, excuse me, on that freeway. Um, so I follow uh, major roads. If I have to, I'll fly from airport to airport. And one of the things I practice on occasion is to have another pilot go up with me and we'll fly over an airport, pull the power back. I have my, uh, I, I use four flights, a wonderful program. And, uh, or if I have a 695 Garmin, whatever I'm using. And I will circle around, practice circling around above the airport with the hood or the foggles on to restrict my vision. Or maybe I'll use the hood and the foggles for really restrictive vision. And I will descend down and circle within about a half mile of the airport, which is actually pretty close, but you can do it with about a 30 degree bank and keep actually even less than that and keep in very close uh, to the airport, circle down. And when you uh, are about 500 feet, you're in a position where you can decide which way to turn to be able to go directly to the run. In other words, uh, which way to turn to go directly to the runway, right turn, left turn and land on the runway. And it takes a little practice to do that, but it can be done, but you have that option too. So it's uh, something that requires some practice, but at least you have an airport you're flying over, as well as flying along following major roads. And other than that, that's what I would recommend for night flying. My, my two biggest, and by the way, have more fuel reserve at night. You know, that is so important. Not landing with two and well 45 minutes night reserve is what the FAA requires you to have but uh, hopefully you'll land with at least an hour's worth of extra fuel in case the airport you're going to is closed or something happens and you know you can't land there and now you, you know, have to do it at night which is a little more critical and and uh, requires a little more thoughtfulness next question yeah I think um, you know I try not to be a fanatic about radio phraseology, but you know, you want to minimize the amount of talk and mm -hmm. use the professional language uh, whenever possible, despite the FA requires you to save a letter three as tree, the letter four as fower, and the letter five as fife. I, I don't, they got that from the Phoenician system, the phonetic alphabet. And, mm -hmm. you know, in honoring the Phoenician, the FA wants you to talk like Phoenicians now. And I always thought it was kind of funny. So you call up the tower and say, tower, this is a, um, a 2 one tree fowler 5 on the approach for only tree 5. Uh, I understand the weather will be, will be bad for it. So I'd be looking for that crazy wabbit. And so you sound like Elmer Fudd is what you sound like whenever you talk like that. But, okay, phraseology. Um, so when I change frequency and I call up or I talk to a, a new controller, I just tell them the altitude I'm level at or the altitude I'm climbing to. That's the best thing to do instead of just saying with you, because what that does is gives me the comfort of knowing that he knows or she knows my altitude. So I, I would say uh, LA Center 213 to Bravo, level at five 5,000 feet. And uh, he'll uh, interpret that as 5,000 feet, which is what he should do. And uh, that's the way that works. So that's what I recommend. I was going to take my, my Cessna 150 uh, a, a few years ago in July. Uh, I was going to fly to Oshkosh because I've flown to Oshkosh in the Bonanza and the 210. But I thought, well, we'll take the, uh, 
take the Cessna 150 to Oshkosh. This was in July. But I thought, no, I need to be home by Christmas. So I don't think I'll do that. And so the farthest I've gone in the Cessna 150, well, with students, I've, I mean, I've, I've gone all the way out to, to Kansas, to Texas, uh, out to, let's see, uh, the area around uh, Dalhart, Texas. I've gone uh, up over the years up to Seattle, out to uh, Idaho. So, you know, a Cessna 150 will get you anywhere in the United States, anywhere. So typically, though, we, we don't, you know, we, we fly a couple hundred miles, Diane and I, my wife, Princess Buttercup. She's an ex-air traffic controller and a commercial mm -hmm. instrument pilot. So we have a great time whenever we fly. So uh, that's what I do. I love flying the airplane. And my preference, of course, would eventually to get a, be able to get a J3 Cub because it's a wonderful airplane. I was in a Columbia, South Carolina one time, and I met the guy, the actual guy, who had the world record. Uh, for the number of hours in a J3 Cub. And this was in, I was doing a flight instructor course in Columbia, South Carolina. He was in the course. I'll never forget it. He had 27,000 hours in a J3 Cub. Apparently got that on two trips to the West Coast. It was amazing when you think about it. So, uh, all right, next question. Think about it this way. <clears throat> for IFR, the construction of low altitude uh, for, uh, and the low altitude en route system, all minimum en route altitudes on airways are required to be at least 2,000 feet above the terrain in, mountain, in, in mountainous terrain. In non-mountainous terrain, it's 1,000 feet. In mountainous terrain, 2,000 feet, that's the minimum height above the ground that any MEA, minimum route altitude on an airway, is allowed unless there is a demonstrated Venturi effect, V-E-N-T-U-R-I, Venturi effect over near and or around that mountain, meaning that when wind flows over that mountain, because of the, uh, the, the geometry of the mountain, it tends to be conducive to updrafts and, wait for it, wait for it, downdrafts on the other side. Whoa. In which case, then, it's not just 2,000 feet. It's 2,500 maybe even 3,000 feet based on the um, uh, assessment of the FA inspectors, uh, flight inspection, making that MEA. So the answer to your question is over mountains, a minimum of 2,000 feet. And if the wind is blowing in excess of 20 knots, higher. Some recommendations are at least one half the height of the mountain, the top of the mountain, uh, the height of the mountain above uh, MSL, height above sea level, if it's 8,000 feet, cross it at 4,000 feet. And you, you, you just can't have enough altitude over a mountain when the wind is blowing at in excess of 25 knots. These are locations of a few mountain wave accidents in Southern California. Now notice, this would be the Sierra Nevadas um, right here, assuming you can see my cursor. The pink dots are locations of accidents that have resulted from mountain wave activity. And this mountain range over here, uh, near, I think it's Eaglesville, is uh, upwards of uh, around 11,000 feet. Three mountain wave accidents occurred there, two of them in IFR conditions. And if you look down here, going down towards San Diego, toward the area of Julian, then you see we have the transverse and the peninsular mountain. There's the transverse mountain range. Three accidents occurred there. Peninsular, three accidents. And these are the ones that uh, I just found without having to look too hard. And notice that the wind blows from left to right, correct? It's the way the wind blows. Those are the prevailing winds. And all these accidents occurred on what side of the mountains? The lee side. The secret for approaching any mountain range, and this is this, you find this way, way back in early 1920 manuals, uh, pilot manuals, and it's, uh, it's one of those long-lived ancient tricks that works really well. If you're approaching any mountain range and you approach it at a 90-degree angle, look at position B, then if you encounter a downdraft, if you're flying 2,000 feet or more above the mountain range, hopefully a little higher with winds in excess of 25 knots, then by the time you experience the downdraft and make a turn that puts you 45 away from the mountain range, the, the uh, linear track of the mountain range, that would be a, 
in this case, 135 degree turn, you have to make a 135 degree turn to get away from the mountain. And you'll be in the downdraft longer. But if you approach the mountain at a 45 degree angle, that range, I do this all the time when I'm crossing a mountain range, approach it at a 45 degree angle. Then if I have to make a turn away from the mountain because I find myself descending on the least side of a mountain because let's say the wind is stronger than I anticipated, I only have to make a 90 degree turn, which would be of course, 30, 45 degrees less than what the airplane in position B made, and I'll be away from the mountain a lot quicker. And that's, does that make sense? Can you see that on there? Mm -hmm. That yeah. is uh, extremely valuable. So that's what my recommendation is for mountain range activity and uh, avoiding that. Hello, folks. This is Rod Machado. I hope you've enjoyed this program. And if you'd like to learn more about other programs that I have, please visit my website at rodmachado.com, R-O-D-M-A-C-H-A-D-O. -A -A and there are many programs there, all the way from private pilot ground school to instrument pilot ground school to the art of takeoff and landings, handling in-flight emergencies, and, well, many more. So hope to see you there.